Welcome back. Uh, we've been on Summer Sabbath for the last month, and uh, I hope that you had some time to spend with family and friends, uh, some time to rest and rejuvenate, to recreate and get yourself uh, firmly rooted with God again. Um, I'm hoping that you got some time to enjoy God's good earth. Much has happened since we were together a month ago. We will be installing a new moderator today. The Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne will be installed this afternoon in a ceremony. I'll post the link so that you can join in on the and watch that if you'd like to. She will be the first woman Indigenous uh, leader of the church as our moderator, and I am really looking forward to the wisdom that she is going to be able to offer the church as she leads us through the next three years. The General Council met this summer and made a number of decisions that I'll be sharing with you in the coming weeks, but one is that they have made a firm commitment to live with respect in creation and to take climate action. And they have recommendations for each and every congregation to consider as we think about our carbon footprint and how we live with respect in, in creation. The Supreme Court in the United States overturned Roe v. Wade, which gives us all pause to think about the roles of religion and government. And the Pope apologized to residential school survivors, something I said would never happen, so never say never. There have been terrible floods and fires, and the world is just over COVID, even though COVID is not yet done with us. Um, the world is is, is moving on. We are wanting to move on. But here at Bondhead United Church, we are continuing to ask people to mask when you are in the sanctuary because we do have a vulnerable population and we want to protect those that we love in this community. So for the time being, we're going to continue to mask when we are in worship together. So just to make a note of that, if you are here worshiping with us in the sanctuary. It's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster over our summer Sabbath, but there, and there is much to ponder, but also much to be grateful for. William Livingston Wallace writes, It does not require much spiritually to be thankful when all is going well, but to be thankful in the midst of tragedy is the mark of a deep faith that in the end all will be well. This was the depth of faith of Gillian of Norwich, the height of the ravages of the Black Plague in England. She proclaimed, all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. This is not only a belief that things will be well in the future, but an affirmation that despite all appearances, to the contrary, at the very deepest level, all is well in the cosmos. Please join with me in our call to worship. Come all who are joyful, all is well. Come all who grieve, all manner of things will be well. Come all you who wonder, 
All will be well and all manner of things will be well in the presence of God. Come, let us share God's presence together with gratitude and thanksgiving. Come, let us worship. Christ candle to invite the presence of Christ among us. So let's take a minute to reflect upon what that means. Jesus walked land his ancestors took by force. He lived under the occupation of the Roman Empire who came into that land, subjugated its people, and made them servants of an empire they had no hope of defeating. And yet he did not cry war. He did not raise an army. He preached a simple message, love thy neighbor. And yet in his name, people came to this land and took it by force. When we invite Christ among us here in the traditional territory of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Chippewa people, let us remember his call to love thy neighbor. Let's pray together. Great Spirit God, we give you thanks for another day on this earth. We give you thanks for this day to enjoy the compassionate goodness of you, our Creator. We acknowledge with one mind our respect and gratefulness to all the sacred cycle of life. Bind us together in the circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and one another. Amen. Good morning. The scripture passage is Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, the Beatitudes. If someone asked you what Christianity is all about, you might say we follow an extraordinary person who said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who, are, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These words describe a radical sense of community perceived from different angles. They are words of comfort for people in need, a call to action for people who can help, an affirmation that we are not alone. God is with us, seen and known wherever we are, needed or in need. If all you ever know about Christianity is this, it is enough. In the lowlands of Western Europe, people stole land from the sea. Inch by inch, they pushed the sea back and built sturdy walls and dikes to hold the sea while they claimed the rich marshy land below it to grow crops and tulips, a flower prized by royalty. The story goes that in the village of Harlem, maintaining the walls and the dikes was the most important job of all. For if the dikes failed, the sea would rush in and drown the entire village. Everyone in the village knew their life and livelihood depended on those sturdy walls and dikes. Now in the village, there lived a young boy named Hans Brinker. One day, his mother asked Hans to take a basket of food to a blind man who lived near the canal. Hans was happy to do it because he loved to sit and talk with the old man. They had a wonderful day together, and then Hans headed home. On the way, though, he noticed water trickling from a small hole in the stone wall along the dike that held back the sea. And he remembered what his father always said. If ever a crack appeared in the wall, the sea would rush in and drown the entire village. Quickly, he climbed up on the wall and shoved his finger in the hole. Thankfully, the water stopped trickling through the hole. But now, he was stuck there. If he tried to remove his finger, the water would come through faster and faster and he was too far away to shout and get anyone's attention. He would just have to wait for someone to come along. And so there he sat. Afternoon turned into evening and evening turned into nighttime. But even though he was hungry and tired, Hans would not take his finger out of the dam. All night long, he kept his finger in that hole until finally, Early the next morning, the village priest came walking down the road. Help! Help! Hans called. The priest rushed off and gathered some men who came with bricks and mortar to repair the hole. And Hans went home, where the village brought him treats and hot chocolate and thanked him for his bravery. I was watching this video of a man who was trying to fix a hole in his above ground swimming pool. At first he thought he could fix it by placing duct tape over a small hole um, where the trickle of water was leaking. But no matter what he did, no matter how hard he pushed on that duct tape, no matter what he did, the water still pushed the duct tape away and kept trickling through. Then he tried plugging the hole from the inside attaching the tape to the vinyl and hoping that the pressure of the water pushing against it would hold the tape in place. But still, the water found a way to seep underneath the tape and escape the pool. Water will always find the path of least resistance. It is against water's nature to be contained. It wants to move, to flow. The story of Hans Brinker is a tale about conquering the natural order of things. It is also a cautionary tale. 
What we know, but is left unsaid in the story, is that Hans could not hold his finger in that dam forever. At some point, he would get tired and the inevitable would happen. At some point, you have to accept that you really have no control over the sea. Water is going to do what water is going to do. We can try, but ultimately, we have no control over the natural order of things. That is the great challenge of life and the reason we cling to God for comfort. That is why the idea that God is in control is so comforting to us because we know that ultimately we have no control. Hans Brinker is also a reminder of how a little thing a tiny little trickle of water can become a disaster. Nicholas V was the Pope in Rome for eight years, from 1447 to 1455, and he inherited a papacy in ruins. Europe was just recovering from the Hundred Years' War between England and France. Constantinople was being pressured by the Ottoman Empire and would fall during his papacy. The Saracens were pushing hard against Emperor Constantine XI. A 50-year pandemic had decimated the population. When he took over the most powerful throne in the world, Pope Nicholas went to work. He rebuilt the sanitation systems of Rome, ordered a thorough cleaning of the plague-ravaged streets, he fortified Roman cities, worked out trade deals, brokered peace between Charles VII of France and Frederick III of Germany. He encouraged the birth of the Renaissance and the advancement in science and art and architecture. By all accounts, his papacy was one of the most successful on record, except for one tiny little thing. In the late spring of 1452, the Muslim Ottoman Empire was expanding its reach in the east. Nicholas was being pressured to authorize a crusade to push back the Ottoman aggressors. But the papacy was in no position to fund a war. So instead, Nicholas issued a papal bull authorizing King Alfonso V of Portugal to attack, conquer, and subjugate Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ wherever they may be found. The bull was meant to support the efforts of individual states to defend borders and push back invaders, something like we are doing with Ukraine right now, offering aid to a country that's being attacked. But the unfortunate wording, wherever they may be found, became the little tiny thing that caused a disaster of global proportions. Those words gave free reign to nations under papal authority, the seafaring nations of Spain, Portugal, England, France, and the Netherlands, to attack, conquer, and subjugate wherever they went. By 1493, the church fully embraced the idea that exploration was for the purpose of bringing souls to Christ. The explorers, however, had no such illusions. Exploration was for the purpose of making money. So they used the church's doctrine, even long after the political authority of the Pope was rejected during the Reformation, to attack, conquer, and subjugate non-Christians wherever they may be found. This became known as the Doctrine of Discovery. In 1792, U.S. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson claimed that this European Doctrine of Discovery was international law. And in 1823, in the Marshall decision, the Supreme Court held that ownership of land goes to the discovering nation not the people who were there when it was discovered, but the discovering nation, not the original inhabitants. 
That means the first people of this land have no legal right to title to land. They have no right of ownership of the land they have lived upon for thousands of years. They only have a right to occupy it, the same right as a rabbit or a deer or a bear. That's how they were viewed by these explorers who took that doctrine and used it for their own gain. This precedent continues and was cited in a land claim as recently as 2007. The doctrine of discovery is woven into the very fabric of Canada. We sing hymns to this very day that suggest every nation belongs to a Christian God. So let's just stop for a minute, back up a little bit and focus on why the doctrine of discovery is so important. First of all, what is a doctrine? Well, the dictionary says, a doctrine is a belief or set of beliefs held and taught by a church, a political party, or other group. It is not a law, it is a belief. When Indigenous people ask us to reject the doctrine of discovery, they are asking us to reject a belief. A belief that started as a tiny little thing, a desire to help an embattled territory, and was twisted and perverted by pirates and crooks into a cash cow that has caused immeasurable suffering to millions of people. It makes total sense to reject a belief that causes such suffering. Jesus did it all the time. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, if your neighbor asks for your shirt, give them your coat as well. Jesus is rejecting a belief that was held by his people, the Jewish people, and saying, you've heard it said, but I'm telling you, believe something different. The trouble, however, with rejecting this particular belief, this doctrine of discovery, what complicates matters is the law that grew out of it. What happens to land ownership if lawmakers acknowledge Indigenous people have the right to title? Will the deed I hold to the land I occupy become illegitimate? These are questions that um, hold us back from rejecting that doctrine of discovery as a belief. The United Church repudiated the doctrine of discovery in 2012. We have long ago said it is not a doctrine of our church, but it sticks in our minds. We have to reject that belief that we hold on to, that is insidiously ingrained in the fabric of who we are. And to do that, it feels a little bit like Hans Brinker holding his finger in the dam. What will burst forth if the law that holds the doctrine of discovery is taken away? Well, I don't know, but I do know that we are called to live as followers of Christ. We are not called to conquer and subjugate the world. We are not called to cause suffering to our fellow human beings. We are called by Christ to live his teachings. And first and foremost among his teachings are these. How liberated are those who have learnt to let go they shall experience the mystery of God. How strong are those who are not afraid to admit their weaknesses, their tears shall heal their grief. How beautiful are those for whom life is sacred, the earth shall rejoice in their presence. How satisfied are those who long to serve God, for God shall be their delight. How happy are those who are willing to forgive others. They shall find release from guilt and fear. How enlightened are those who know oneness with all things. They shall see God everywhere. How inspiring are those who work for justice and peace. They shall live as children of God. What an opportunity there is for those who suffer in the cause of right. Their rejection can become a doorway 
to new life. This is a paraphrase, of course, of the Beatitudes that Sarah read for you earlier. Blessed are we when we follow the way of Christ. Blessed are we when we let go of beliefs that no longer serve us, that cause suffering for others. We are called by God to be a blessing, and by being a blessing, we are blessed. Jesus calls us to find strength and humility so that we can discover Christ in each other. And that is the doctrine of discovery that Jesus teaches, that we can discover Christ in each other. Let us pray. Holy One, sometimes it feels as if we are holding our finger in the dam, afraid that change will wash us away. Help us to trust in life after the life we are living. Help us to trust that change brings opportunity. Help us to trust that you are leading us in the paths of righteousness. Help us to trust to look for the good way, to listen for truth and to act with love. You who fed us in the desert, who leads us through the unknown, we give you our humble praise this day and every day. Amen. to in-person worship each Sunday here in the sanctuary and our online services will continue on our YouTube channel. Our pork barbecue is back. We're going to be hosting our uh, annual pork barbecue on Friday, August the 26th. It's going to be a drive through again this year. It was really successful last year doing it that way. And so we're going to do it again. So we're asking that you pre-order your meals by contacting pork barbecue, pork BBQ, at bondheadunitedchurch.ca and place your order before the 19th so that we know how many pork chops to, to cook on, our, on the grill and, uh, and then come and pick it up on the 26th from 4.30 um, on. So that's our biggest fundraiser for the year. So we're hoping that you will come and enjoy uh, your meal uh, with us. Um, we are also so grateful for all of your financial support as we continue our mission and ministry here at Bondhead United Church.
Let us pray. God of immeasurable grace, bless us with spirituality as deep as the ocean. Call us to a discipleship as bold as the saints. Compel us to a justice as daring as the Redeemer's love. Lead us, O God, in all we do, as we extend compassion to strangers, as we offer a hand of help to friends, as we nurture relationships with loved ones. Lead us, O God, in all we say, as we speak your wisdom in our community, as we represent the church, as we follow the way of Jesus. Lead us, O God, in all we hear. Help us to discern the truth, to sift through misinformation and lies that line the pockets of those who will not see, nor hear, nor do what is just. Lead us, O God, in the footsteps of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you are feeling like you have your finger in a dam, if you are feeling overwhelmed and anxious, follow Jesus. If you are feeling as though you have your finger in the dam, as though the world is changing so fast that you can't stem the tide, follow Jesus. If you are feeling as though you have your finger in the dam and you are weary and don't know what to do, follow Jesus. We will follow you, O Christ, into the needs of the world, into the truth of our lives, into the pain of our hearts, into the presence of God. Follow Jesus into the presence of God. Have a great week, everybody. Amen. <music>